treasurer and Dr. Trupti Yavatkar, webinar coordinator. I'm working as associate professor in department of Rog Nidan in SC Mutha Aringla Vaidyak Mahavidyalai Satara Maharashtra. I welcome you all for the 25th Naidanik webinar series, August 2024, which is approved by NCIM Mumbai. This is the 36th academic activity of our organization. Today we are here for the second lecture of the series. This particular series of lectures is on gastrointestinal disorders. As we all know, how much importance is given to Annava Srotas in Ayurveda, which corresponds to the gastrointestinal system. As per Ayurveda, the entire metabolism is governed through the GI tract. And this metabolism is affected in various disorders of gastrointestinal system. Majority of the patients attending the uh, gastrointestinal OPDs are suffering from IBS, almost 60%. This disease is common in Indian society since ancient time. In Ayurveda, this disease is referred as grahani. Diarrhea due to stress and anxiety is told as the precursor for the IBS in Ayurveda. The topic for today's webinar is irritable bowel syndrome that is IBS and we have among us the esteemed young energetic gastroenterologist to guide us on this topic, Dr. Saurabh Patlesar. Before starting our lecture, I would like to request Dr. Amit Dhane, sir, Associate Professor, MES Ayurved Mahavidyalay Khed, to give the brief introduction of our RVPG organization. Over to you, sir. Thank you, madam. Uh, uh, the RVPGA Association uh, was uh, formed in the year of 2016 under the able and dynamic leadership of Dr. Subhash Vage, sir with the aim to give the legal status of pathologist and radiologist to the PGs of Rognidan. Our association is duly registered under the Societies Act of 1860 at Charity Commissioner Office, Nagpur. Postgraduate students, teachers of Rognidan and Vikruti Vidyan and Chaya Vikiran Vidyan and postgraduates of modern diagnostic subjects can become our member, that is RVPGA uh, Association. Our is the only organization which fighting for the lawful rights of Rognidan and Vikruti Vidyan PGs. Even the NCISM had also directed state of Maharashtra to consider RVPGA as a stakeholder in the constitution of pathology regulatory bodies of the state. RVPGA is now pursuing this matter of lab permission with state and central government. Not only this, RVPGA is constantly pursuing the implementation of NCISM salary structure in all uh, private Ayurvedic colleges across the nation. All the communications and details are also up, uh, uploaded on the uh, association website that is www.rvpgaNagpur.com. There are many activities conducted by the uh, association. Uh, I'm uh, briefing these activities. Regular conduction of online webinars and uh, offline seminars, both national level and international platform. So uh, far, uh, now we uh, conducted near about 25 national webinars on different diagnostic topics. We have conducted a national conference on uh, X-ray diagnosis at Nagpur. Our second uh, national conference on uh, CT scan diagnosis is scheduled on 20th of this uh, October at Nagpur. Hands-on training programs for PGs of our partners, NABL accredited pathology laboratories at Nagpur, Mumbai and Pune and other cities of Maharashtra. We have uh, conducted a microbiological hands-on training program for the PGs on 9th of March 2024 at Nagpur. And we will be conducting uh, another workshop on molecular pathology techniques on 19th of October, 2024 at Nagpur. Uh, related to publications, publication of research paper of Nidan students and faculties in our peer review international journal of diagnostic and research that is IJDR. Interested can visit the journal website www.igdrindia.com. Up till now, two issues have been published uh, from the uh, association. Edited books, uh, volume series through our international publication, RIPI, which is registered in Government of India ISBN portal. Those who want to contribute book chapter can visit 
रीपी वेबसाइट www.rvpgaiip.com we can publish all india rog nidan pg thesis book consisting of all the rog nidan pg titles from 1985 to 2023 uh, for the e uh, easy reference of our pgs and faculties this year we are publishing all india rog nidan phd thesis book we are giving legal fight for the issues of rog nidan and vikruti vidyan pgs of uh, at appropriate forum we have to uh, our uh, youtube channel and facebook page where all educational activities in the past and live are published there this is all about rvpg association and its activities uh, running on thank you madam thank you so much sir for giving such a nice introduction of our organization and its activities thank you so much uh we'll just uh, wait for few minutes to move further as our speaker uh, sir, the speaker is going to join with us it's kind request we'll wait for few minutes हेलो एम ऑडिबल वेलकम सर हेलो गुड आफ्टरनून सर यस गुड आफ्टरनून आई एम रियली सॉरी फॉर द डिले गॉट स्टक इन सम इमरजेंसी डिस्पाइट द टाइट टुडे यस नो प्रॉब्लम सर नो प्रॉब्लम वी विल स्टार्ट नाउ ओके नाउ आई वुड लाइक टू इंट्रोड्यूस आवर टुडेस इस्टीम्ड एंड डिस्टिंग्विश स्पीकर डॉक्टर सौरभ पटले सर He is a gastroenterologist, hepatologist, and interventional endoscopist practicing at Max Super Specialty Hospital, Nagpur. He has been trained from various prestigious institutes in India, like GMC Mumbai (JJ) and Medanta the Medicity uh, Delhi (NCR). He also holds fe uh, fellowships in hepatology and a fellowship in interventional endoscopy. He has done specialization in advanced endoscopic procedures like endoscopic ultrasound, ERCP and third space endoscopic procedures like POEM and ESD which are available at very few centers across the country. He has a vast experience of treating common as well as advanced gastrointestinal, hepatic and pancreatic diseases like GERD, dyspepsia, hepatitis and cirrhosis. gallstones gi bleed cancers cirrhosis uh, cancers pancreatitis ibs and ibd etc so i welcome you respected sir dr saurabh patle on behalf of our organization we are we are honored to have you here sir for enhancing our knowledge regarding the topic i request you sir to start the session and it's a humble request to all the participants kindly mute yourself so that we can hear the lecture properly over to you sir thank you dr tripti ma'am for the kind introduction thank and you. thank you all the esteemed colleagues and my dear friends for being here on this day for this presentation uh we are going to talk about ibs today irritable bowel syndrome it is a very common problem which we see in our day to day opd these days i am going to share my slides soon are you able to see the slide uh, in a proper way or it is tilted no sir it is visible okay. it is good okay yes. Yes. so um, thank you everyone uh, without much ado i'll start my presentation on irritable bowel syndrome so now we know that for the past 2 to 3 decades our our uh, concentration has been on organic diseases infectious diseases of the gi tract 
jaundice, liver cirrhosis, pancreatitis, all these diseases. But now as our lifestyle is changing, these organic diseases are getting uh, towards the better way, but we are facing more functional diseases problem. So it has been, the focus has always been on organic disease in the past, which have a definite clear etiology, clinical pathological features. There are specific guidelines, diagnostic tests, and effective treatment for those. But since last one to two decades, as our life is getting more advanced, more westernized, we have been confronted with a constellation of abdominal symptoms which do not have any structural basis of clear understanding what is going on, how is how is it going on. And it has been labeled as functional GI disease or FGI disorders. So there are many functional bowel disorders. Out of these, two most common are irritable bowel syndrome and functional dyspepsia. So functional bowel disorders is a term basically that describes a problem with how the stomach and the intestines function or work. There is no structural problem with them. It is just the functional problem which is happening and giving the patients all the symptoms we have been facing. So there are others such as epigastric pain syndrome, cyclic vomiting syndrome, chronic idiopathic nausea, PPDS, this is postprandial distress syndrome, but the most common ones are IBS and functional dyspepsia, out of which IBS is the commonest one. Today, for the scope of the topic, we are talking about irritable bowel syndrome, that is IBS only. So this is a very common functional disorder of the gut. I am very sure most of you also get a lot of patients of IBS in your OPD. They come knocking on your door with various abdominal symptoms. The prevalence is high, around 10 to 20 percent of uh, the world population. This irritable bowel syndrome is characterized by chronic or recurrent abdominal pain or discomfort, which is associated with altered bowel habits. And there is no organic dysfunction. There is no organic uh, explanation of these causes. The diagnosis is mostly symptom based because there are no specific biomarkers or lab tests which can prove that this is irritable bowel syndrome. Also, previously the understanding was that you should rule out all the important diseases before labeling a patient to be having IBS. But now the things are changing. Now we have to apply the diagnostic criteria and the diagnosis is mainly clinical and investigations are to be done only if you are highly suspecting something bad some organic disease like an elderly patient or who is having some red flag symptoms such as anemia, weight loss, dysphagia, uh, GI bleed, all these things are, if are there, then you have to do a lot of testing. Otherwise, the diagnosis of IBS is mostly clinical and suspicion based. So it was previously dismissed as a psychosomatic condition. This patient has just a problem in because there was no clear etiology and it, it affects almost 70% of patients are females. And this condition is not fatal. So it was just being overseen. This is a psychosomatic disorder and it will be taken care with just antidepressants and stuff. But now the attitude towards IBS is changing. And the incidence and prevalence was not extensively monitored in the past. But now as we are monitoring it, we are saying that the prevalence as well as incidence of the uh, IBS, that is the already known patient and new patients, is much more than it was being estimated in the past. Because we were not looking through that lens. So now these all thinkings are changing towards the IBS. The worldwide prevalence, as I said, is around 10 to 20 percent. India per se is near about 10 percent, but it is gradually increasing over the years as more and more people are seeking medical attention and are getting diagnosed as IBS. So as I said, again, 20 percent of US population, it reports symptoms consistent with IBS. The most common GI diagnosis among GI practice in the US is IBS actually. And one of the top 10 reasons for the primary care physician visits in the US. It affects predominantly females, almost 70%. And as I said, is the most common functional bowel disorder. These all are facts uh, done by epidemiological studies in the US over the past three decades. IBS can cause great discomfort, sometimes intermittent or continuous for many decades in a patient's life. But as we will as we will go ahead, we will see that almost 70-75% of people do not seek medical attention for these things. IBS symptoms can significantly disrupt daily life. It can have a negative impact on quality of life. The current treatment options are dietary modification, fiber supplements, some pharmacological agents, and behavioral or psychotherapy. The success of current treatment options in addressing the multiple symptoms of IBS still has been limited. That is, Despite of all the measures being taken, sometimes we cannot relieve the patients of IBS, symptoms of patients of IBS. So as we can see, almost 75% of the patients are non-consultors. They do not actually seek medical attention. They take it as indigestion or constipation or stress-related problem. And because it is not fatal, most of the patients do not even care to go to the doctor for that. 
hardly 25% of the pe people consult and almost 2 to 5% of people go till the specialist like a gastroenterologist for seeking answers for their symptoms productivity burden why ibs is being so given so much importance now because it is it is resulting in a lot of work absenteeism people are remaining absent of absent, absent at their work because of the ibs symptoms as we can see here days per year the absenteeism is more in patients with ibs than non ibs patients this is statistically proven data back uh, 30 years back there is a lot of impact on the patient's work due to ibs the patient with some missed work days is around 30% and the average number of missed work days per month is 1.7. The patients who cut back on their days, that is they go early home, is almost 46% with average number of days cut back in a month is 3. So it is impacting the work pattern, it is impacting the work burden, it is impacting the absenteeism at work. That's why IBS is being given so much importance because it is affecting quality of life of the patient. So etiology, we are still not sure why it is happening. But yes, there are definitely many theories which have been proven time to time to be true. First of all, and you will go across this term very commonly in this presentation, that is visceral hypersensitivity. Basically, it is caused by heightened sensitivity of both peripheral and central nervous system due to inflammatory and non-inflammatory agents. So how did we know this? There was an experimentation done around 30, 40 years back a balloon was distended in the intestine of the patients who were having functional GI symptoms and normal patients. So it was found that awareness and pain caused by the balloon dilation in the intestine are experienced at even lower balloon volumes as compared with controls suggesting receptor hypersensitivity. So the patients who have visceral hypersensitivity, they have increased sensitization with pain because of distension in the intestine. This is what happens actually in IBS. A lot of bowel distension, bowel spasms, but the pain perceives is more in the IBS patient as compared to normal people. Abnormal gut motility, which is very important feature of IBS, one of the diagnostic feature, you cannot have IBS without alteration in the bowel movement. Either you have to have constipation or diarrhea or mixed symptoms. Then only because uh, we will come to the diagnostic criteria of IBS, it is one of the diagnostic criteria. So there is increased frequency and irregularity of luminal contractions which increases the abnormal gut motility. And now if you combine it with the first point, that is visceral hypersensitivity, these luminal contractions cause pain. There may be prolongation in the transit time, resulting in constipation, predominant IBS, and sometimes exaggerated motor response to cholecystokinin and meal, resulting in diarrhea predominant IBS. So gut motility may get slowed down or heightened up also. Then there is some role of autonomic nervous system uh, dysfunction the imbalance resulting from increased sympathetic and decreased parasympathetic activity. Role of SIBO is also there, that is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Almost 84-85% of patients with IBS have been found to have SIBO. That's why rifaximin helps in these patients of IBS if given for a period of 3-4 to four weeks. And there is some microscopic inflammation which was proven on biopsies. There is increased number of lymphocytes, mast cells in the uh, biopsies of colon and small intestine. There are also elevated levels of pro-inflammatory interleukins and cytokines which have been observed in the biopsies. So there, there is definitely a role of some microscopic inflammation also, although not in all cases. So these stimulators of the gut motility and increased sensitivity to pain, they may be inflammatory as well as non-inflammatory like diet and allergy also. This is very important and I think you must be seeing these patients, although some are getting missed. Wherever you come across a patient who is having altered bowel motility and some abdominal pain, but the patient is not getting uh, help with antibiotics and antispasmodic, do ask a history of recent bowel infection. You will definitely see a patient who will say, Mujhe der do se abhi pet mein dard hota hai, bar bar motion jane ka man karta hai, khana khata ho to bar motion mein jana padta hai, aur kisi chiz se aram nahi pad raha hai. When you ask them, kya aapko ek do mein pehle kuch diarrhea hua tha, ya aapko yaad aray ultia aur loose motions hue the. If that is post-infectious IBS, the patient will tell you, ha, mujhe isse pehle episode hua tha, char din bahut loose motions the. Then that is probably the post-infectious IBS. So basically what happens, whenever a bowel infection happens, small intestinal or large intestinal, even after the infection goes away with antibiotics, let's say you give uh, ofloxacin or nidazole or some bowel effective antibiotic, the infection will go away, but the heightened sensitivity, the autonomic response, it persists and the patient still has symptoms. So in these patients, if you see, the count will be normal. 
CRP will be normal. There will be no anemia in all the blood tests, ultrasound, CT, you will not find anything because the infection has gone. The inflammation has gone. The heightened sensitivity is still there. That is post-infectious IBS. So you have to keep an eye on post-infectious IBS. If the patient gives a definite history of some food infection before the onset of current symptoms. There is a role of food intolerance and allergy. So um, there are, you must have seen more, many, many patients come with food allergy testing. food allergy allergy These things are to be taken with a pinch of salt. What I mean, although it may help, that is uh, these patients have IgG uh, antibodies, IgG levels to specific food like कोई बोलेंगे अदरक से ज्यादा IgG लेवल है कोई बोलेगा कि मुझे बेसन से ज्यादा एलर्जी है बट यू विल सी दैट द पेशेंट इज 50 इयर्स ऑफ एज ही हैज बीन हैविंग अदरक एंड बेसन फॉर लास्ट 50 इयर्स ऑफ हिज लाइफ विदाउट एनी सिम्टम्स सो दीस फूड एलर्जी टेस्टिंग्स दे आर नॉट रियली सेंसिटिव रियली स्पेसिफिक दे आर वेरी सेंसिटिव बट नॉट स्पेसिफिक इफ इट इज शोइंग हाई IgG लेवल्स डेफिनेटली डज नॉट मीन दैट द पेशेंट इज एलर्जिक टू दैट बट समटाइम्स इट मे हेल्प इन रिड्यूसिंग द IBS सिम्टम्स इफ वी डेफिनेटली अवॉइड दोस थिंग्स इन योर डाइट so this food alteration diet alteration can be advised to the patient if he is not getting relieved with medications there is a role of carbohydrate malabsorption fructose we know is very notorious for nafel the nash for obesity for metabolic syndrome for ibs also so fructose intolerance suggested as a possible form of carbohydrate malabsorption it contributes to the gi symptoms symptoms after a carbohydrate challenge are more easily produced in ibs as uh, there is as there is in celiac disease there is some role of gluten sensitivity also so there is a role of food intolerance and allergy but somehow these allergies and food intolerances they are not very nicely characterized in studies so we we really don't know whether this will definitely help or not but yes if the patient is ready some specific food items which the patient is seeming allergic to can be skipped in the diet and it may give help in the symptoms of ibs psychosocial factors very important point stress anxiety depression phobia somat somatization all are a part and parcel of ibs i would say there is no patient of ibs who does not have stress as a aggravating factor all the ibs whether it be ibs d ibs c or ibs mixed type everyone will have an aggravating factor of stress whenever there is stressful things in the lifestyle the symptoms of ibs they go up there is some role of genetic factors because ibs has been found in families parents their kids also get uh, get ibs it is more of a behavioral problem the cultural problem what are they doing in their home what thinking they do uh, they understand with their food and their habits all of this obviously percolate in the generations what the parents will be thinking about food what cultural practices they will be following the kids will also follow so that is one of the reason that ibs may run in families that is if a person is having ibs his kids of getting ibs also goes high so as a I said the etiology is multifactorial so many things are there to think about and we have to apply a tailored approach in all the patients we come across about the pathophysiology how things are happening since 1950 over the last 50 to 70 years things have changed initially we just knew that it is abnormal motility eventually there came the concept of visceral hypersensitivity which we just talked about that the nervous system response is very high in the intestine as compared to the normal people then for the last one decade there is a lot of talk about brain gut interaction so now a new term has come gut brain axis what is gut brain axis gut that is intestine brain obviously we all know there is a communication between these two with the help of enteric nerves so if anything happens any kind of inflammation or non inflammatory stimulus to this enteric nervous system the patient develops heightened sensitivity to pain the patient develops abnormal gut motility which will which leads to ibs so if reversely said the ibs patients have a defective gut brain axis and there are drugs to take care of these and the recent one which is now being thinked about is serotonin mediated visceral sensitivity and gut motility phyht and agonists uh, are being used as a treatment so serotonin you know, you know it, it is a pleasure or a pleasure hormone it gives you relief whenever good things happen in your life so serotonin mediated visceral hypersensitivity and gut motility it is it is another pathophysiology which is being considered as a role to be having in ibs so all of these are the pathophysiology mechanisms there is altered bowel motility as we said visceral hypersensitivity there are some psychosocial factors neurotransmitter imbalance and there may be a role of intestinal infections which are recently there like in post infectious ibs
as i already told enteric nervous system it controls the motility and secretory function these are the two functions secretions and movement which are being controlled by enteric nervous system it is semi autonomous that is, the actions can be modified by parasympathetic and sympathetic uh, nervous system but they may function independently also it contains many neurotransmitters like serotonin substance p vasoactive intestinal peptide and calcitonin gene related peptide so any imbalance in this neurotransmitter that will also cause defect in the working of enteric nervous system so the current final recent thinking thinking on the pathophysiology of ibs is that there are defects in the enteric nervous system which may lead to the hallmark symptoms of ibs visceral hypersensitivity and primary motility of the gi tract which is altered because of uh, abnormal neurotransmitters now 5ht that is serotonin which is the latest thinking which i was telling about that the serotonin mediated visceral hypersensitivity the serotonin hormone is secreted 95% in the body in the gi tract by enterochromaffin cells and neuronal cells only 5% is released by the cns so this is a very important point that's why serotonin has got such a role in ibs and all the symptoms are predominantly gut related bowel related because most of it is secreted in the gi tract actually so how it happens there is increased intraluminal pressure because of food or because of gas the intestine distends this pressure is passed on to the mucosa from the mucosa to the enterochromaffin cells and there is a secretion of uh, there is activation of 5ht receptor and secretion of serotonin so this is how the peristaltic reflex is mediated by the enteric nervous system with the help of serotonin so the serotonin receptor effects are they mediate reflexes controlling the gastrointestinal motility and secretion and they also so mediate the perception of visceral pain so what are the types of ibs ibs c wherein one fourth of the stools are hard or lumpy and less than one fourth are loose or watery that is more of hard stools ibs d as the name suggests more of loose stools ibs m is mixed that is uh, both of the patterns are present and unclassified that is unsubtyped ibs there are no not enough stools and abnormal are abnormal to meet the criteria for any other subtype the ibs u subtype is very confusing generally not put on paper very difficult to understand but most of the patients fit into ibs c ibs d and ibs m category ibs m that is the mix is the most common type in clinical practice ibs c ibs d are pre uh, the prevalence is similar alternating ibs is also a term not commonly used who have alternative bowel habits and almost 30% of patient from ibs c they pass to ibs d within one year so ibs d then becomes more prevalent there are a lot of non gi symptoms ibs can actually be uh, contributed by any symptom from head to toe but most common ones are headache back pain fatigue myalgia dyspareunia ur urinary frequency and dizziness also the patients with ibs they may have other comorbid conditions whose prevalence was uh, more commonly found that is gastroesophageal reflux disease there may be overlap with functional dyspepsia and other somatic conditions such as fibromyalgia chronic fatigue syndrome chronic pelvic pain uh, tmj disorder and and interstitial cystitis so these are comorbid conditions or overlapping situations which occur with the patients of ibs it was uh, ibs diagnosis when we talk about the definition how to tag that the patient is having ibs the patient should fit in the room 4 criteria there are four room criteria till now so room 4 is the most common one for avoiding confusion we'll just read the room 4 criteria so the patient who is having recurrent abdominal pain on average at at least one day per week in the last 3 months and all of these symptoms are happening thing till at least 6 months okay plus two of these three that is related to defecation that means the pain gets relieved after defecation associated with a change in the frequency of stools and associated with a change in form that is appearance of a stool stool became mushy stool became hard stool became a little, a little bit loose or stool became watery so we will repeat the definition the patient will definitely have abdominal pain remember without abdominal pain no ibs absolutely no so the patient should have recurrent abdominal pain at least one day per week in the last 3 months and onset was around 6 months back plus two of these three it is related to defecation associated with change or form of the stools if the patient is fitting in this criteria then we have to consider ibs in him now as i talked about previously what are the red flags where you will be more attentive that this may be something else which is more dangerous and sinister 
if there are any red flag features such as anemia, fever, persistent diarrhea, rectal bleeding, severe constipation, weight loss, <laughs> nocturnal symptoms of pain and abnormal bowel function, family history of GI cancer, IBD or celiac disease, and new onset of symptoms in the patient who are 50 years of age. Now, why are we talking about this? Because right in the first slide, we said that IBS is a functional disorder. It is not a structural disorder. If all of these things are present, then the patient is suspected to have some structural disorder and it will need more diagnosis. Like if a patient is coming to you with, he's satisfying the criteria of IBS, no doubt, but his hemoglobin is seven, then it is not IBS. It may be some GI cancer also, which is leading to anemia. So basic lab evaluation should be done in the patients to rule out more important disorders, which are more dangerous and life-taking than IBS. We will go to the workup next. So what should be done? When should be done and who should be investigated? So if a patient has typical features of IBS, according to the definition, and if the patient is less than 50 years of age, we should order CBC to look for anemia and other blood counts, electrolytes to check for an imbalance, LFTs to check for liver function and more importantly, albumin. Why albumin? Albumin is the most important blood test for chronic disorder in the body. Any chronic disease will have hypoalbuminia for sure. It is not just nutritional. The body depletes in albumin in chronic disorder. So if the patient is having an albumin of 4 plus, very likely, very unlikely that the patient is having some chronic disorder. So LFTs and screen stool for occult blood and sigmoidoscopy can be considered in this patient, not necessary. So CBC, electrolytes, LFT and screen the stool for occult blood. If the patient is more than 50 years of age, now he is going in the spectrum of colorectal cancer. So again, CBC, electrolytes, LFTs and we should perform a colonoscopy because ideally, according to the global guidelines, any person who is more than 50 years of age should undergo colonoscopy as a screening. If it is normal, then again, for 10 years, he doesn't have to go. But after 10 years, it should be screened again. Because of socioeconomic issues, we don't have the guidelines of screening colonoscopy in India. But all the Western and developed countries, they follow the protocol of uh, colonoscopy at the age of 50 years. So in this patient, colonoscopy is a must. As I have told all these things again, uh, for full blood count should be done. ESR to check for an inflammatory activity, CRP also for inflammatory activity, antibody testing for celiac disease. It is not mandatory in India because we have a very low prevalence of celiac disease here. But in uh, according to the Western guidelines, it should be done. But we can definitely skip on this. The easier ones are CBC, electrolytes, LFT, CRP, ESR, basic blood tests. These tests are generally not necessary to confirm diagnosis. Ultrasound, flexible sigmoidoscopy, colonoscopy, thyroid function, Fecal ovine parasite testing, fecal occult blood, hydrogen beta. These, these tests should be categorized for some patients whom we are suspecting are having some important organic disease. The differential diagnosis which IBS matches with are malabsorption, some dietary factors, any bowel infection, inflammatory bowel disease, psychological disorders, sometimes some gynecological disorders such as pelvic inflammatory disease and other disorders. So all in all, how to diagnose? With any of these symptoms, patients is having, uh, according to the Rome 3 criteria, Rome 4 criteria for last six months, that is abdominal pain, bloating, change in bowel habits, change in bowel type or form. <coughs> then we should take a patient history and clinical examination. If it is diagnostic criteria is IBS positive, it should be managed as IBS. After basic investigations such as uh, uh, full blood count, ESR, CRP, albumin levels or LFTs. If there are any red flag symptoms like rectal bleeding, weight loss, uh, family history of cancer and late onset that is more than 60 years of age, then we should do further examination and blood testing to rule out any other organic disorder. Now comes the last part of the uh, presentation that is management of, of IBS. A lot of management goes on dietary modification and patient assurance. So first of all, we should establish a positive diagnosis. We should reassure the patient that there is no serious organic disease or alarming symptoms and it will be taken care of with medications and some time. The success of current treatment options in addressing multiple symptoms of IBS has been still limited. So the cornerstones of management of IBS are dietary and lifestyle advice, pharmacological therapy, some psychological interventions and complementary and alternative medications in few cases. So education, reassurance, Dietary modification, fiber supplementation, symptomatic treatment, psychological or behavioral options, and we should have realistic goals. Don't 
assure the patient that within one week you are going to be okay. We know that IBS has a lot of management spectrums and despite of utilizing all the management options, the patient may not still feel 100% good. So do not set unrealistic goals before the patient. Reassurance is more important that it is going to take some, take some time, but you will get relieved with this. So initially, as I said, education and reassurance is important. Dietary modification should be done. We will come on that later. Exclusion of gas producing foods such as cabbage, beans, uh, carbonated drinks, cheese, those should be avoided. Lactose should be avoided, that is milk and milk containing food products. Low FODMAP diet, we are having a separate slide for that. I'll tell you what is it that. Basically, it is a diet low in <coughs> fermentable carbohydrates, fermentable oligo, dye, and monosaccharides and polyols. Gluten should be avoided. Fiber should be included in the diet and food allergy testing is optional if the patient wishes to go for it. So this is about FODMAP diet. So these are fermentable oligosaccharides, disaccharides, monosaccharides and polyols. These should be avoided. That is our diet should be low in FODMAP. So in oligosaccharides, there comes wheat, barley, onion, white part of spring onions, garlics, uh, other legumes, dry fruits like cashews and pistachio. Just a minute. Yeah, in disaccharides, milk, custard, ice cream, and yogurt. In monosaccharides, apples, pears, mangoes, watermelon. I'm really sorry. I'm presenting from the phone, and that's why this is happening. Uh, in the polyols, there are certain fruits like apples, pears, apricot, cherries, peaches, plums, watermelon again, mushrooms, cauliflower. So actually speaking, in FODMAP, that is in high FODMAP diet, a lot of food products come. In low FODMAP, the options are very low. But at least which are more common ones, we can try to avoid and give the patient a low FODMAP diet. This is a Western chart. Even if you go on Google, you can find a low FODMAP chart diet specifically for Indian patients because all of the many of these food, food products we do not utilize in India. But you can get an Indian low FODMAP diet chart even on Google. Now about pharmacological therapy, it is advised as an adjunctive therapy after lifestyle modification, dietary modification and reassurance and education of the patient. So it is advised that an adjunctive therapy with moderate to severe symptoms of IBS that impair the quality of life. It should be based on the predominant symptom and subtype. That is, for obviously for IBS D patients, some constipating drugs should be given. For IBS C, some diarrhea causing or bowel clearing agents should be given. <laughs> so, <coughs> sorry. <coughs> For IBS-C, that is constipation predominant IBS. Just a minute. Yeah. So for constipation predominant uh, IBS, there are laxatives such as osmotic laxatives, polythene glycol or lubiprostone or uh, uh, linaclotide, that is the guanyl cyclase um, uh, agonist, or 5 h 4 agonist, such as tegacerod. All of these patients, all of these drugs, they cause the bowel to clear early. They are laxative, so they will be used in IBS predom uh, predominantly, constipation predominant IBS. For IBS D, some drugs which decrease the frequency of stool and cause the stool to be more solid in consistency should be used, such as opioid receptor and agonist, such as, such as loperamide. Now, loperamide is a drug which comes by the name Imodium or Lomotil or Ridol. It is rampantly used in general practice. But we have to make sure that we are using loperamide only if we have ruled out infection in the... Um, only if we are ruled out infection in the etiology. Because if the patient is having some infective diarrhea, colitis, and if in these patients you give loperamide, the infection will flourish more because the infected bowel, the infected stools, they will be accumulated inside the intestine. They will proliferate and cause more infection. So before giving drugs such as loperamide, we should definitely rule out that this is IBS and this is not some infective diarrhea which is happening. Some bile acid sequestrants like cholesteramine, cholestipol or cholesalbum. 5-H23 antagonists such as allocetron can be used. <laughs> All of these are anti-diarrheal agents which are most commonly used in IBS D type. Now comes the most important part, pain, which is the predominant symptom in IBS. So what can be done for the pain? So there are a lot of antispasmodic agents such as dicyclomine, uh, hyoscyamine, 
these are the previously one used but they have a lot of anticholinergic side effects or uh, anti muscarinic side effects dryness of mouth tachycardia so these are now being avoided much safer just such as mebeverine now newer ones have come such as pinaverium bromide uh, all these drugs can be used as antispasmodic they are uh, musculotropic antispasmodic drugs and do not have anticholinergic side effects and there is a role of antidepressants such as amitriptyline nortriptyline imipramine they also slow the intestinal transit time by their anticholinergic property and also have some behavioral modification that's why they cause uh, decrease in pain in the patients of ibs some antibiotics such as rifaximin have also imp uh, shown improvement in the symptoms because we know that 84 to 85% of the patient have sibo small intestinal bacterial overgrowth there has also been a role of probiotics because when we talk about bowel inflammation all that bowel inflammation comes because of alteration of gut bacteria whatever helpful probiotics we have they get uh, uh, translocated by the pathological bacteria and then the inflammation starts so to reduce that inflammation use of probiotics has also been suggested in the patients with ibs whichever type it may be so the final slide my concluding slide would be what to do in the patients with ibs how to manage so if the patient is having ibs we have diagnosed it there should be good communication about the symptom reassurance dietary and lifestyle advice should be given <laughs> after the discussion if the patient is good and it does not have much symptoms he can be discharged otherwise further lifestyle and dietary advice should be given including discussion of exercise relaxation and probiotics if it fails then the dietitian referral should be taken and low food map diet should be uh, given to the patient if there is a failure then we should have direct pharmacological treatment according to the symptoms for abdominal pain as we said we have antispasmodic like mebeverin or pinaverin bromide and if it is not helping then neuromodulators such as tricyclic antidepressants or ssris can be tried for constipation definitely laxatives are to be given if not helping then secretagogue such as linaclotide which is new one in the market lactide that can be given as a secretagogue which secretes more more fluid into the bowel and relieves the patient of constipation for dry diarrhea predominant ibs gut uh, uh, like slowing drugs anti motility agents such as loperamide can be used or <coughs> newer drugs such as <coughs> Eloxadolin or 5-HT3 receptor antagonists such as tegosterone can be used, and it gives success in the patient's treatment. If all of these things are not helping, then the patient may be referred for for uh, cognitive behavioral therapy or gut directed hypnotherapy to a psychologist because there is a lot of uh, psychosomatic factor also in the symptoms of IBS. Thank you. So this was the uh, uh, the presentation about diagnosis, prevalence how to approach a case of uh, ibs and current management options which we have in the patients of ibs i am hopeful that all of you will get some help in your practice by discussing the, these pearl points which i have mentioned in the presentation and uh, thank you for patient listening to my talk i am ready to take any questions if you have thank you uh, just just a minute Thank yeah. you so much, sir, for your valuable guidance regarding the IBS, its pathophysiology, multifactorial uh, etiology, management, and all things, diagnostic tricks, etc. Uh, yeah. Definitely, all the delegates must have benefited after hearing your lecture. Uh, before Thank going you. to question and answer session, uh, now we will mm -hmm. move towards the opinion of our chairperson. I would like to introduce and invite our today's chairperson, respected Dr. Sachin Naik, sir. Sir is Professor and HOD Department of Rog Nidan in B.R. Harney Ayurvedic Medical College, Mumbai. He had published many research papers in peer-reviewed ISSN journals. He is invited as resource person at many institutions. With this short introduction, I invite you, sir, for your expert chairperson's remark. Respected. Uh, thank you. Sir. Yes. Thank you, madam. Am I audible? Yes, yes. Clear. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Actually, Saurabh, sir, has, uh, is, a, is a really an exhaustive lecture. And we, I gained uh, so much knowledge from it also. So right. there are so many things actually that I agree with the sir. That is, mm -hmm. it's a functional disorder, and mm -hmm. uh, mostly, actually, we also see post-infective focus in the patient is also there, and yes. gut motility is increased. That that is okay. I mean, uh, uh, it's a, it's really we find, and you know, uh, basically there is a one you as rightly sir said that there is a gut uh, gut brain axis is there. So yes. in Ayurveda, we call mostly this uh, as a Grahani Vyadi. And uh, mm -hmm. as there, you rightly said, uh, rightly mentioned about the room, right of four, 
so that is uh, uh, that is the change in the uh, defecation defecation habits that is sometimes hard stool sometimes root stools is there so we call it as a mukurbaddha murdram so this is a also we uh, study in ayurveda and rightly and, and what dietary modification i can suggest i suggest to my uh, patient and they get benefited is i asked my uh, patient to have fruits first and then have his uh, diet so his diet also is lower and uh, he gets he gets benefited by it usko mai kehta hu ki thoda sa papaya santra wagaira kha le then you can have your normal diet so reduction in diet also happens and he gets benefited and the treatment uh, is also there uh, i agree to that and abdominal pain is there and sir also said about the test complications and uh, that there is a uh, function of serotonin is also there so all in all it's a very informative and uh, great lecture so i look forward to listen to sir again and again so thank you very much sir thank so you, it's sir, a great lecture yeah, yeah thank yeah thanks sir thanks thank you so much sir for your valuable inputs and guidance regarding the topic uh, if anyone has any queries you can put it in the chat box so that sir can answer the queries it's a request to all the delegates if any queries uh -huh. you can put it in the chat box uh, so diabetic patient i am Yes, yeah, sir. Sorry, we have sorry. questions in the chat box, sir. Okay, so uh, in the chat box, I can see one question: Diabetic patients and IBS any relation? Now there are few things uh, about diabetes specifically. It can be motor or sensory. Sensory, it is seen as a peripheral neuropathy. All these patients they have pair me jalan or talo me jalan or they have this peripheral neuropathy. They also have autonomic neuropathy. Autonomic neuropathy, most dangerous is we know that they can have painless MI. They can have MI and not have chest pain because there is autonomic dysfunction also. This autonomic dysfunction is projected in the gut also. That can lead to symptoms which are similar to IBS. That is dysfunctioning of the gut brain axis because it is an autonomic function. It can get affected with diabetes. So patient with diabetes can have IBS more commonly as compared to non-diabetic patients. Number one. Second thing. Most of the patients are at least on metformin if they are on allopathic medication. Metformin is drug which can, if given for a prolonged time, which will definitely be given for prolonged time, in a specified subset of patients, it may cause duodenal atrophy or blunting of duodenal force, which will lead to diarrhea, bloating, and similar symptoms of IBS. From, for, so from, from diabetic perspective, if the patient is coming to me with symptoms of IBS, I would also look at this angle. So how will I tackle it? I will correlate it with uh, diabetic nephropathy because it is said when the patients are diabetic nephropathy, they also get retinopathy and nephropathy. Sorry, when the patients get diabetic neuropathy, it generally comes with some amount of nephropathy and retinopathy. So anyways, we do retinopathy and nephropathy check in these patients. If the patient is having nephropathy and retinopathy also, then the patient having diabetic autonomic neuropathy causing IBS-like symptoms is very common. So reassurance is very important. Treatment will be symptomatic depending on the spasmodic pain and diarrhea or constipation. Second, if the patient is on high dose of metformin, such as 2 gram of metformin, then the likelihood of metformin also, also causing IBS D like symptoms is very high. So I will rule out that possibility and try to change metformin or decrease the dose of metformin if he is on very high dose of metformin. I think I, uh, I hope I answered your query. Second is role of amitriptyline in IBS. Very important. Amitriptyline is one of the tricyclic antidepressants which is very commonly used in GI practice, let it be IBS or not. The important role of amitriptyline in IBS is amitriptyline is one of the tricyclic antidepressant which causes decrease in gut motility. So if the patient is having IBS D, so out of desipramine, imipramine and other SSRIs, I would rather rely on amitriptyline. So IBS D may amitriptyline better has a tricyclic antidepressant. And definitely uh, it helps in the symptoms of abdominal pain as well as the uh, loose stools also. Third question is um, albumin in LFT, it indicates what? So yeah, uh, albumin is also an inflammatory marker, we should remember. So if albumin is low, either the patient is having malabsorption for a longer period of time or he has any other chronic disease. So if albumin is low, then your chances of IBS being the being the diagnosis goes very, very rare. IBS will never have hypoalbuminemia because the gut lining is intact. There is no problem with the intestine. It is just the functional bowel disorder. 
So low albumin in LFT, that means something else is going on. Whether it is chronic inflammation, whether it is malabsorption, <laughs> that is causing the uh, disease and not the IBS. So that's why albumin is very important as a chronic inflammatory marker. First of all, let me congratulate sir for the excellent presentation uh, of the subject. And I think uh, sir had answered every question uh, very well. Uh, just uh, from my side that uh, diabetes can coexist with the IBS yes. or it could be a, sometimes patient may approach for constipation and accidentally may get diagnosed as a diabetes. True. Uh, this likely, uh, this can be there. And exactly as sir said, the metformin may flare up the symptoms of uh, IBS. And uh, yes. another thing that both the diseases, they have etiological uh, uh, common thread that is mental stress. Yes. And both the diseases are now uh, more and more importance is given to mental stress. And now one more thinking in the, in the development of diabetes is that it is the stress which is causing the disease. Yes. And, and another thing is the, uh, the importance of stress in, is in uh, undoubtedly in the IBS. Uh, so both the, the from that point of view, both the diseases, they have a common uh, etiological risk factor. Etiological risk, sir. And uh, <clears throat> one thing I want to just to know from the sir that uh, sometimes it is said that uh, IBD, e, uh, IBS, actually IBS is a low form of IBD. Yes. So IBD uh, definitely is an organic disease. Okay there will be definitely bowel inflammation. Without bowel inflammation, we cannot call it IBD. But yes, IBS, if the patient is having symptoms, initially the symptoms of IBD basically may mimic IBS. The patient will be having not much of anemia, not much of hypoalbuminemia, inflammatory markers will be fine, but the patient is having bowel symptoms or the patient may get diagnosed at, as IBS. But further follow-up of the patient and development of other symptoms and clinical examination may later find out that it was actually IBD, which was starting back then. So that perspective, because IBS is never a static diagnosis. The patient will develop some other disease at some point of time. So we have to be examining the patient, checking the patient for more symptoms and trying out whether other causes can be there for the patient's symptoms very frequently. So regular follow-up is also very important in these patients. I think, uh, uh, thank you, sir. One advice we must give to all the audience that if any diarrhea going for more than a week, we must evaluate it for the IBS. Yes, yes, true. We should do that. Uh, because in Ayurveda also, uh, they mentioned Bhaya Jati Sar, Shoka Jati Sar. Means um, the diarrhea which is uh, triggered by the uh, factors like anxiety or factors like uh, whenever uh, we, had, we had suffered a mental trauma and after that uh, he is uh, facing the diarrhea then one must re one must give a harshana ashwasan chikitsa that is reassurance what we call the assurance reassurance chikitsa and after that they said that if any patient of infectious diarrhea mm. uh, uh, any patient of infectious diarrhea who face the condition like uh, more badam more than alternating constipatory and diarrhea like symptoms Yes. Then that disease is a granny which is uh, uh, which is corresponding to the IBS uh, syndrome in modern medicine. And another thing, one last point I would like to highlight that uh, in as far as treatment of the uh, uh, IBS is concerned, Ayurveda has uh, highlighted on giving the buttermilk, which is a probiotic. Yes. Lot of uh, lot of uh, and again and again again and again they had asked to give the buttermilk. And Takra Rishta. So, in that perspective, I think that their bacterial overgrowth should be studied in at a deeper length uh, yes. as far as IBS is concerned. And it needs to be the role of bacterial overgrowth needs to be uh, re explored uh, with regard to IBS. Yes, sir. So thank you very much, sir, uh, for sparing your valuable time with us and for an excellent presentation of the subject. 
now i request uh, our uh, our coordinator tukti madam to just give a uh, uh, dais to uh, out of thanks for uh, to dr snehal rane for out of thanks yes sir yes thank you thank sir you. for all the solving all the queries of our delegates uh, now we will move further towards the vote of thanks i request dr snehal rane madam assistant professor siddhakala ayurved mahavidyalay sangamner to give vote of thanks over to you madam thank you ma'am am i audible ma'am Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes. yes. Okay. I would like to thank our today's speaker, uh, that is Dr. Saurabh Patne sir, for delivering such a wonderful lecture on today's topic, that is IBS, uh, irritable bowel syndrome, for their awesome presentation. Thank you so much, sir. And our chair, Dr. Sachin Naik sir, organizes organizer introduction, uh, Dr. Amit Dhane sir, our coordinator, Dr. Trupti Trupti Yavatkar ma'am. Thank you so much, uh, and big thanks to the uh, for organizing this webinar series, and RVPJ president and secretary, uh, Dr. Subhash Wage sir. And lastly, I would like to thanks all all sincere audience for listening and joining the webinar. Also, I would like to uh, invite all the members to to become a RVPJ lifetime members. and uh, requesting all to register the upcoming seminar that is uh, which is held on uh, october 19 uh, thank you so much and thanks for this wonderful opportunity all of, all of you yes i request all the delegates to register for city scan national conference on 20th october and those who are interested can register for uh, x ray workshop to be conducted on 19th of october and uh, the molecular pathology workshop as well thank you very much as rightly said uh, snail madam thank you for reminding thank you everyone thank we can you. end the meeting thank you thank, thank you, you for the patient listening thank you yes. thank you thank, thank you, you sir and thank, thank you all sir. the delegates